Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be right now. Welcome to today's Information Week and Dark Reading virtual event, Becoming a Security Detective, Gathering and Analyzing Security Intelligence in the Enterprise. You're attending the NetIQ Platinum Sponsor Feature presentation, Stop the Breach Before It Happens, Easy, Smart, and Powerful Security Management Solutions. It's brought to you by NetIQ, Information Week, and Dark Reading, and by UBM Tech Web. I'm Steve Kosky. I'm a contributing editor for Information Week, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few housekeeping announcements before we begin. First thing to know is that the slides are going to advance automatically throughout the event. You can submit technical questions via the Ask a Question window, and there's a live engineer on duty who will support anyone having technical difficulties. If you need further assistance, you can also visit the help space in the virtual event. You can also download a copy of the slides. Just click on the information button located in the toolbar. You'll find that below the presentation window. Also, if you'd like to tweet while you're watching the webcast, feel free to drag the Twitter window to expand it to the right. And uh, that's one way you can communicate with us as well and, and with uh, other attendees on the event. Also you'll notice that you can maximize, minimize, you can even resize every window on the console to suit your needs. So if something seems a little small, drag it to make it larger. And at the bottom of the console, you'll see a panel of buttons which you can open during the webcast for more information and other ways to interact. So now on to the presentation. I would like to introduce our guest today. Garv Hayes is Security Software Architect at NetIQ. Garv, thanks for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, Good to have you on the call with us. And I, I do also want to mention that uh, Renee Bradshaw from NetIQ will also be joining us for the Q&A. Renee, thanks for being on the call with us this morning. No problem. All right, and, and with that, uh, Garv, I'm going to turn things over to you. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. I think Steve covered all the, the time zones. So we can move on. Um, as Steve mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to you about breaches um, and going forward how we can prevent or at least diminish those and recover from them. So um, the environment that we find ourselves in today is that we have reduced workforces due to the economy, uh, consolidation, other staffing factors, you know, perhaps even uh, management and acquisition. So each of us is expected to do more with less, um, but we also have to be cognizant of the threats to our organization and, and the integrity of our data. That was actually the photo that Information Week wanted me to use for this, uh, this presentation. I don't know how you got your hands on that. <laughs> Uh, thanks to Renee. <laughs> I've got a face for radio, so anyway, <laughs> continue. All right, so the, um, in order to address threats, we have to identify them in the first place. Um, now, we may not be able to counter the threats, but we can certainly mitigate them, and we want to undertake some risk analysis so that uh, we reduce the exposure to our company and our data and, and our customers. And so, I, you know, these days you can't pick up a newspaper or look at a blog article or some article online without seeing evidence of some break-in or, you know, some calamity. Um, and in this slide, we're just kind of depicting some of the things that have gone wrong. Um, and so the, when, when things go wrong, we have to recover from it. But uh, as we go forward talking in these slides, we want to, you know, do more than merely recover. We want to have some preventive measures in place and be able to anticipate some of these things. So on this slide, we have a list of companies. Um, what do each of these have in common? Well, each of these have suffered a breach recently. And so you know, we're looking through the names. We've got RSA, Lockheed Martin, the Epsilon Email Marketing Group, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase. All these guys have suffered a breach or an attack. Um, you know, going forward, Verizon reports about 900 breaches over the past six years. So 
this isn't a problem that's going to go away. It's, it's something that we're going to have to face and address. Um, one of the, the incidents that has received a lot of press coverage is, is something called Operation Aurora. And so this was an advanced persistent threat against Google. Now, uh, an advanced persistent threat is just a fancy way of saying that, that a sophisticated and long-running attack was perpetrated um, against Google, not only Google, but, but these other people. Um, and so you know, in the earlier slide, we also saw Google. And here we see them again. And, and you may be thinking to yourself, now wait a second, Google, don't these guys have a bunch of rocket surgeons working there? Well, yes, they do. But the point here is that no one is unassailable. That um, you know, regardless of how smart or prepared you are, uh, you're, you're probably going to suffer a breach. And so the, the important thing is to discover that the breach has taken place, then be able to recover from it and mitigate it, and then put policies and procedures in place to, to minimize your exposure and, and um, mitigate the risk. Uh, so beyond Aurora, we have something called Operation Shady Rat. So again, um, we have attacks against the, the government of the United States, Canada, South Korea, uh, other organizations such as the UN, the International Olympic Committee, and then you know, 12 defense contractors. So I think we're just hammering home the point that uh, these breaches are happening and, and we have to be aware. And so that leads in into the, the material that we're going to cover today. Uh, I like to call this the five W's. Um, it's not really five, it's, it's more like four, uh, and then one of the W's actually an H for how, um, and then you get extra credit if you can understand the why. The forensic analysis may never tell us that, but um, understanding people's motivation may be important. All right, so what I'm about to describe next is I actually suffered a break-in, and so I'm going to go through the steps to how I recognized that the break-in was transpiring and what I did about it. And then the lessons that, that I learned in this experience, I think we can take forward and um, use as elements of a security policy so that you know, we can do more than just suffer break-ins, that we can actually be, aware, be ready for them and, and mitigate them. So to kind of set the stage from my personal experience, uh, in the mid-90s, I was the system administrator for a small ISP. And so um, what had happened is that customers had, had been calling in and indicating that the, the system was not responsive and, and you know, that there was other issues. And so um, I had to dig in and figure out what was going on. Now, I've, I've discussed some of this incident in a, in a recent blog post. I'll leave this up for a minute. Everyone can see the URL. And as Steve mentioned, these slides are available for download. So you can always come back to this and get that if you're interested. All right, so we were talking about um, you know, the customer calls up and says, hey, the system is slow. What's going on? And so in, in my case, um, the, the problem was fairly new. I was not aware yet that there was an issue. And so um, where to start? In my case, I just started to, decided to go with the basics. Now, um, before I go forward, in, in these slides that I'm going to show, I'm using native tools. You know, we're going we're gonna to go native here. And so people may ask, why, why are you using those tools? Well, the, the first thing is that they're simple and easy to use. Um, the next thing is, is that they really illustrate the underlying, underlying principles of what we're trying to portray here. So that I think once you have an understanding of, of how things work, you, know, you may not need to have a, an intrinsic understanding down to the, to the bit level. But if you have a conceptual understanding of, of how the system works, then I think that prepares you to purchase a solution or you know, otherwise integrate one together. And so in this case, I started out looking at the disk usage on my system. And I noticed that. There was 100% disk usage. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, I just bought a brand new disk. Why is this thing full already? 
and you know, as, as part of the of sound practices, I had instituted disk quotas so the users couldn't overwrite the space allocated to them. And so, you know, immediately as alarm bells are going off, uh, I know that there's something wrong. Um, and so, you know, beyond the, the tool that I'm showing here, I used some other tools to, to dig in and, and figure out what was going on. Um, and so using um, DU, which is uh, disk use, I was able to find out the offending files. And what had happened here is that um, some malicious, per malicious persons, we don't know yet, had installed an IRC bot and an IRC client, but they'd used that as an opportunity to store tons of folders or files on the system and, and exhausted the disk use. And so I was able to you know, pinpoint where that had happened and which account that was associated with. All right, so um, I realized that you know, we're out of disk space, but the, that's, that's going to cause some problems to the end users. But um, I wanted to look for some other clues as well. And so I wanted to look at the, at the running processes uh, to kind of get a, a a picture of the you know the heartbeat of my system or the general health. Um, so, what are we looking at here? We're looking at at memory and disk use on the system. Um, what each process or service is using. And what's important to note here is that you know looking at this uh, from a lay perspective, you're going well. You know, what does all this stuff mean? Well, this is this is showing a, a percentage of CPU usage and, and memory. And what's important here is to understand what is normal use in your system and, and set up some benchmarks so that if something deviates from that, then you'll be aware of it. Um, and so, you know, in this case, we're we're monitoring it manually, but in in a larger organization, that's not going to scale. You know, you're not going to have you know people that can go and sit there and watch these screens all the time. You need some type of automated alerting system in. OK, and so you know, returning to the theme of the, the four or five Ws, um, we want to find out who did this. Uh, and so what, what I'm looking for here is non-active users or someone that hasn't accessed the system in a long time. Um, the reason that, that I want to look at those is because those are a great target for um, hackers and, and other malicious parties. Um, that's a kind of a you know a, a good entry point into the system. Um, that that speaks to you know, good policy and sound practice. Again, is that that we should have an effective um, user deprovisioning process so that when we know that a, a user is no longer allowed on the system, that that there are checks in place to enforce that. Um, so moving back to our scenario, I wanted to see who had successfully logged into the system. Um, and so again, using the native tools, uh, I take a look at um, what users or processes are logged in, and are they still there? And so there's a, a couple of, of native tools that we can use to do this. And, and by the way, we're, we're looking at a Unix-like system or Linux, the, the tools are similar, but, but have a different feel on Windows. And, and we'll touch on some of those as well. Um, it's also important to mention that the identity management has its own market, but it is a, it's a great partner to security solutions as well. I think the, the ability to effectively manage um, users or parties that are accessing the system is, is key to a good security policy. In, in general administration sound practice. Um, so you know, not only are we going to be interested in who actually succeeded in logging in, we want to see that who failed, you know, who's, who's rattling the doorknob, if you will. And so in this, this slide, we, we can see that, well, somebody was trying again. So um, I think we're zeroing in on the who here. Okay, so I'd mentioned that, that we'd talk about um, Windows as well. Uh, if, if you're, if you're going to do this using native tools on a Windows system, where would you look? Um, the answer there is the, the event log. Um, that's where we have uh, various logs. There's application logs, security logs, system logs. And so with, with respect to logins, uh, those are going to be in, in the security log.
Um, and so, you know, we, we know that there's a problem, and so now we're trying to determine, well, is it happening right now, or did it happen at some time in the past? What's, what's the timeline here? And so the question that we're asking is, who is on my system? Um, kind of as a sidebar here, it, there is in the book Takedown by John Markoff, it, it describes uh, an incident between Kevin Mitnick and Tsutomo Shimomura, a, a security researcher. And so um, Mitnick was, was using Shimomura's system to hop on to, to uh, another system to get access to the telephone network. But they were kind of playing a cat and mouse game that Shimomura was saying, you know, something's odd. I, it feels like there's somebody there. There's you know, somebody peeking around the corner. And you know, meanwhile, Mitnick's covering his tracks and deleting logs and, and, and trying to hide his presence. Um, in the end, uh, Shimomura was, was able to gather enough evidence to, to convict Mitnick. Um, and so I I'd, I'd mentioned Takedown, the book Takedown by John Markov. There's a, a new book by Mitnick called Ghost in the Machine. And so it kind of tells it from Mitnick's side. It's interesting. And, he, he's uh, spoken on um, uh, some of our webcasts before with dark reading, and he's quite a character. <laughs> he is, definitely. Now that's you know that's in recent history. I don't know if there's any old timers on the line, but the, I think the the first guy to kind of bring this to the people's recognition is Cliff Stahl. He was a, an astronomer that managed some Unix systems, and he experienced an intrusion, and he wrote all about the uh, the experience in the book The Cuckoo's Egg. So I think I've gone off in the weeds here, and so I'll, I'll get back on track. But, um, so again, we're you know we're addressing the four W's, if you will, and, and the who. All right. So moving on, um, uh, and, and making that determination is you know is this person still on the system? Um, part of the who is, is we want to determine is this you know an insider? Is this an external party that's accessing my system? Um, where are they coming from? Uh, and so this, this native tool here, Netstat, shows us connections uh, to our system. And so we can, we can determine if, if it's a local connection or if it's coming from you know, across the country. And so you know, we show this, this graphic that um, the access to your system is, is not limited to people in your building. You know, there's, there's other ways to access it. And so this is, this is an important tool to show those active connections. And it also leads to you know, another sound or best practice, if you will, that, that you only want to have the amount of services running on your system that are necessary for the business. So anything that's extraneous needs to be turned off, and, and there needs to be a policy in place that enforces that. Um, and so you know, in this case, we see all these connection attempts to you know, port 50775 or 27017. What are those? Do we, do we really need those to be open? Um, you know, in, in this case, if, if we have a, a web application that has a database back end, then yes, maybe so. But that leads us to you know, further policies that are they protected, et cetera. Um, so again, um, in the, in the, when I've been switching back and forth between the, the Unix-like and the Windows native tools, um, you may have noticed that you know, the Windows philosophy is more for a, a graphically oriented interface, whereas the Unix is text-based. Um, in this case, the, the tool, the native tool on Windows, Netstat, appears very similar. Um, this, you know, for the geeks out there, this goes back to the POSIX roots of, of NT and, and meeting the POSIX specifications. All right, so let's catch our breath here. Um, we've, we've been researching who and, and we want to transition to the what. Uh, actually, we, we know the what. They, they filled up our disk with all these extraneous files and, and stuff that we didn't want on the system. Um, and so you know, while we're diagnosing the what, we want to kind of put the pieces together. And so earlier I had mentioned that, that inactive or uh, retired accounts are, are a tempting target for malicious persons. Uh, in this case, you know, I'm going to use the name Bob. Um, the, the account that I found that the access was made through was, was an account Bob. Well, I, I don't think Bob really installed this IRC client and bought, because that's not the kind of subscriber that person was based on their subscription profile. But nonetheless, 
somebody masquerading as Bob is on the system right now. And so, you know, earlier we had looked at the diagnosis of of which users had come had came in. Now we can go back and say, oh well, we think it happened with Bob. Um, and so, uh, another piece of the puzzle is is log management and log analysis. Um, on on most systems, there's a, a certain amount of, of default activity that gets logged, and you can turn on more. The the art of of it is you know determining what's too much. You know, you turn on full logging and full auditing on your system, then good luck using it because it's it's not going to be available. But you need enough so that you can um, recreate an incident that happened. Um, you know, you may be asking yourself, well, why are, why are logs so important? Why do we want to keep these? But as I mentioned, you, you want to be able to recreate the event. Uh, the logs can be used as evidence. Uh, and then besides the obvious forensic value, um, these log events are valuable as a predictor of, of something that might be about to happen. So if, you know, if we look through our, our system log and we see that our SCSI devices are spewing all kinds of messages, that, that may suggest to us that there's going to be an imminent failure of our disk subsystem. And, and so we have the opportunity to, to prevent that and tackle it before it becomes you know, really bad and, or there's a potential data loss. Um, again, in the logs, we can also see failed access. And so that we can correlate against what we saw with the native tools on, on who was logged in and, and when. Uh, there will also be evidence in the log files as well. And then again, there will also be evidence of login failures. Um, and so that, you know, circling back to the, the five or the, the four Ws, um, we also have an idea of when, because there's timestamps in these logs, and so we can we can pick a place in time that this happened. Uh, and so, you know, once again, going back to the back and forth between Linux and, and Windows, um, Windows events are logged in the Windows event log, uh, and um, just this slide shows where they're located on on the actual operating system. Um, so you can interact with these with the native tools or with APIs that that Windows supplies. Uh, and then this particular screen is just a, a detail of a, of a certain event. Um, in this case, uh, we're seeing a DNS client error, which may be an indicator of a you know, DNS spoofing attack. All right, so to, to kind of wrap up, um, what had happened is Bob it had come in, and, and it wasn't Bob; it was a it was a malicious person. They they'd leveraged a send mail exploit, exploit, excuse me, to to get root access to the system, uh, and then they'd reactivated the Bob account, and then started storing you know their little trophy files or whatever in in the Bob account and over on the disk. Uh, so I was able to recreate all these steps, figure out what happened, remove all the files, and then lock out the Bob account for good. And I started paying attention to cert advisories and, and keeping my system patched and updated, um, which you know, leads to another best practice, is that a patching policy. You know, the patching may seem cumbersome and a nuisance, but it's you know, such a low-tech thing to do, and so most of the vendors make it so easy that you know there's no excuse for not doing it. And I, I think Sony is le learning that lesson the hard way. So as we kind of summarize and move forward, we want to make the transition from an investigative mode to a deterrence or mitigation mode. Um, and so we do that by you know, leveraging these same forensic techniques to apply them in a, in a proactive manner. Um, obviously, we've seen uh, that we're monitoring the system. Uh, we also want to monitor the file integrity. And you know, through this whole exercise, I did it using native tools just to illustrate the underlying principles of, of how the system works. But you know, that's, that's a tough proposition for a large organization to, to have all the staff learn this esoteric knowledge and, and become you know, domain experts, if you will, in, in this type of um, 
system administration. So I, I think we need to know what to look for, but be cognizant that commercial tools are available to address these kind of issues. And so if you, you understand how things work, then I think you can make a better purchasing decision on, on getting the commercial tools. Um, so you know, if you can't develop the knowledge in-house, then you can purchase it, and then you don't have a problem. Um, you're able to perform audits and, and maintain security policies and, and pass regulatory compliance, um, thereby using the resources that you have, which, as we've seen, are probably fewer than before, uh, more effectively and efficiently. So that um, as we discuss solutions, um, you know, and, and moving from a forensic standpoint to a more proactive one, there's there's something in the business that we call event enrichment. So taking the the raw native logs from the native tools and adding value to them and, and performing the correlation. You know, all through this out this exercise, I did the correlation manually, but that's not going to scale to a large organization. You know, if there's hundreds or even thousands of servers, I can't go visit each of those. I, I need I need a tool to automate that for me. Um, and so invent enrichment kind of ties these separate tools together, you know, where we, we identified the who, the what, the when. Um, we can take the, the native events and enhance them and, and add, OK, this event, the person that did this or process that did this was Bob, for example. Um, so you, you're taking your Leatherman tool. Well, I guess the analogy would be that you take all these tools and combine them into one, and, and you have this nice Leatherman tool that, that uh, is multi-purpose, but in a single pane of glass. Uh, and so you know, once again, we see that the who, what, when, and where theme is recurring. OK, so um, as we move to conclude, I, I just wanted to show some case studies that, that kind of showed some, some other people's struggles with these kind of issues. And, how they dealt with it. So the, the first case study is the New York City Health and Human Services. Um, what, what their problem was is that they had silos of systems, that there were multiple disparate systems and processes, and they required a headcount of 20 people to manually review and monitor the logs. Now, um, you know, again, going to the IDC data, 86% of victims had evidence of a breach in log files prior to the breach. So if, if only these people had an effective system to monitor the logs or alert them that something is happening, they could have mitigated the breaches. Uh, and they could have addressed their audit and security gaps. So in the case of HHS, uh, they purchased a log management system and a security incident and event management system. So they were able to you know, take all the siloed, disparate procedures and processes and, and consolidate it into something that was more automated and manageable. And that, that you know, fewer staff were required to be dedicated to this. Okay, the next case study is a large global retailer. Um, in this case, they, they had a visible and costly breach. Uh, and so they, they were unable to meet regulatory compliance, and they were failing their audits, and, and there was noticeable security gaps. Um, they had a highly distributed and outsourced IT environment, and so, you know, the kind of who's doing what, and the, and the identification of the who was, was difficult, if not impossible. And so, what they eventually ended up doing was purchasing again a log management solution, and a security incident and event management solution. But in addition to that. Uh, they purchased a file integrity monitoring solution um, so that they could control they could be alerted and be aware of changes to sensitive data on the system okay and so uh, that's that's about the end of my material and my talk and I'm going to turn it over to Renee thanks Garb that was very informative. I've, I've heard it before when we were chatting about it, but it's just always so very interesting to me, uh, especially the way you show. I mean, these are kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what is happening when you know a breach is potentially occurring. And you know, like you said, it, it's it's wonderful when you've got like a garb or a thousand garbs 
to kind of go through the data and parse it and piece it together. But you know, actually, most organizations, especially, for example, the ones that you just went through their case studies, and probably for the majority of you out there, you don't, you don't have 1,000 GARBs on your staff, 100 or two, and you need um, tools. So um, what I'd like you to, in, to do very briefly here is just learn more about um, some of the solutions that NetIQ has to offer, particularly in log management and security information and event management and file integrity monitoring. Um, you need to have all of those simple tools you know, in your toolbox in order to help you more effectively meet compliance mandates and to know what your users are doing at all times. And it helps you do it in a, in a more efficient and a um, automated matter, manner so you don't have to go through the logs. So, and also, uh, importantly too, you know, come visit us in our booth, talk to some of the product experts, and don't forget, if you complete the survey that's located just above the chat window, um, you have a chance to win an Apple iPad too. Um, so with that, um, I'm really excited to join you all for Q&A if you have any questions for me. Uh, but uh, I imagine there's a mini brewing there for Garv. And um, Steve, let me turn it over to you so you can moderate for us here. All right. Thank you very much. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the concept of a thousand Garvs. <laughs> a thousand points of light is how I kind of <laughs> see that. Um, but um, we'll, we'll make do with just one on this, to, uh, on this webcast to answer your questions. And a couple of good questions have come in. Um, remember that you can, you can go ahead and um, submit your questions at any time now. There's a little ask a question box down at the bottom. And um, I'm going to have to replace that picture of myself with the one with the bag on the head. This, this was uh, self-shot holding the camera out in front of me. And, in a hotel room. But um, the first question that has come in, and um, the, I think we should answer this one for Robert in the audience, is how would you know if your diagnostic tools were compromised uh, to not show you the compromised files, processes, and data? So how do you know what you don't know, I guess? Well, that's a great question. Um, that I didn't have time to cover that, but uh, you know, there's a way that you can circumvent the native tools using uh, rootkits and Trojans, and so this is a great question. I think um, you know, one solution is to is to be able to perform a checkpoint on your solution before you actually connect it to the network at large, and and take digests of all the critical binaries. So, for example, you know on the on the last command and the and the utemp on the Linux system, uh, I would want to go through and and perform an SHA hash on the actual binary, and then when I go back to do a forensic analysis, I'm going to compare the hashes so that I know that I don't have a Trojan utility running, that I'm actually running the real thing that, that's intended to be there and is you know, not subversively slipping data out to somebody else or you know, allowing the attacker to, to cover their tracks. OK, real good. Um, Renee, anything to add to that? No, that was great. That was great. All right, All right. excellent. All right. Well, Lightning round. We'll we'll, uh, we'll keep going with these. Another uh, question has come in from Carla in the audience. Are we better off using native logging tools or investing in a comprehensive tool? Well, um, you know, without sounding like a shill here, I, the, the problem <laughs> this is, is a softball. Go ahead, <laughs> knock it out of the park. I, I can <laughs> probably jump in on that too later. I'll, I'll do softball. Gar, the, please, you first. But the issue here is scalability. So you know, again, in a large organization, we're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of systems. And so, if you're using the the native logging tools, how are you going to manage those? I, I think you know you can look at a couple of solutions. One would be maybe a hybrid solution where you consolidate um, the the disparate logs from systems. But you know, if you're in a mixed um, heterogeneous environment, the, that just increases the trust. The, the difficulty of the situation. So, I, I would think, depending on the size of the organization, um, you know, the answer is it depends. But in a larger organization, you're you're going to want to use something that consolidates the native logs. Uh, yeah, so it's just not feasible to to go through all those native logs when you can when you have a tool that can can uh, analyze that data for you and and you know show you the things that that you need to deal with immediately. I guess. Yeah, that, that's right. And I mean, and, and you may have the, if I may jump in now, you, have the, uh, you, know, you may have the native logging turned on, but 
you know, um, Garb mentioned multiple times that in a lot of the breaches that Verizon has seen, that you know, they there was no one looking at the logs because it's just so. I guess that you know, Garb, you've used the word esoteric, and just so it's not very human readable. And you know, in, in today's day and age, you know, you don't have a lot of subject matter experts lying around. You know, there's you you, you may be having um, you know using um, less skilled workers and so you know some of the tools that that are available are are you know with logging tools and security information event management tools what those get you is they kind of get you um you know almost expertise in a, in in a package so to speak i mean the 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 data from the native logs is correlated for you it's presented in a in a in an enriched fashion that you can actually um you know make some progress. You can look at the information and react quickly. Because as Garb said, if you're, if you're looking at the logs, you're going to see precursors of a security breach. You, you'll see them. They're there. You just need to find them. And package solutions, you know, and such that, that, that we're able to provide. And you can learn more about the booth in the booth. But package solutions are able to help you in these larger heterogeneous environments pull all that information together, correlate it for you and present it to you in a human readable fashion. And you can make judgment decisions on how to reduce the risk on any given security event, and thereby you know, close that window of opportunity that a malicious insider or maybe an outsider posing as an insider, close that window of opportunity they have to attack your uh, sensitive information. So I mean, it, yeah, I, Carla, that was a great question. And I think that, yeah, I think it's, a, it's very important to take a look out there and see what what the tools are available to you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, it was a good question. And, and um, you know, if there were a thousand GARVs, the, the problem is you couldn't afford them all. And um, uh, I have spoken with, um, you know, security folks in defense and um, in, in uh, Department of Defense. And, and they, you know, they do have people poring over those logs, but it's very, very labor intensive. And you have to have very high level people doing it. And it's not something that, that they really want to do. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, it's tough, tough work. But um, so having these tools that, that uh, give you sort of a dashboard is just invaluable. Um, what um, is a question coming in from um, Kathy in the audience. What is invent, event enrichment? So event enrichment is is adding additional value and and some rudimentary correlation to the native event. So if we look on a, on a Unix or a Linux system, there's the syslog, and the the services and applications write these cryptic messages, um, but they don't really tell you you know who did it um, and how they were running. And so event enrichment uh, allows you to layer on top of the native logs and add some correlating information. So you know, we we can see which process caused this message to be written, and which user credentials was that process logged in with. OK, very good. A um, couple more questions. First, I just want to uh, give, give some shout outs. Um, uh, Tom wrote in, great presentation. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, we, we appreciate those comments, too. And uh, a couple of people, both uh, Mark and Matthew, said cuckoo's egg is, should be required reading for Security professionals, so they appreciated your reference to that that great book. Um, That's funny because Renee wanted me to take that part out. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Garv. <laughs> I'll just be well, waiting. That's where there's a thousand of you and only one of her. Okay, you got her. Hey, you got her. one in a million. Outnumbered. Somebody give me a shout out for that, okay? I'm begging. <laughs> okay, Carla, come, come on, give us give us a, a hand here. Um, a question uh, has come in from Jeff. What is the most common thing people should be looking for as an indicator that they have been breached? Well, that's another great question. I think in the, in the presentation I referenced file integrity monitoring. Um, that is a good tool to indicate whether or not you've been breached. Uh, so in, in file integrity monitoring or like technology, what you want to do is, is take a baseline or a snapshot of your system as when it's in a known good configuration and then do subsequent comparisons, um, you know, what, what we could call delta reporting. And so if, if you go back and, and you snapshotted your system when you deployed it and you come back and 
you know, you've got some clue that something's wrong, the system is slow, or you know, maybe you just have a gut feel that, hey, something's wrong, well, you can, you can confirm that with, with your baseline. You can go take a look and, and see if there's been a change from when you first benchmarked it. And, and that will be a, a sure indicator that, that something has happened. Okay. And uh, uh, Renee, I, I don't see if you can see what Carla wrote in. She says you are definitely one in a million, and no one can do what you do. Yeah, she's she's a very wise woman. <laughs> I, I just have to say that. But um, yeah. Okay. On to All the right, next. Enough yeah. of that, you too. All right, stop it now. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, that's what people should be looking for um, if they've been uh, if they've been breached. Now, um, one of the things that I have heard in some of the other webcasts that I've moderated is that uh, particularly with um, with these uh, long-term um, uh, hacks that people stay resident and are, are siphoning off data over a long period of time um, and we're going to be talking about these in, in uh, some of the later webcasts today with uh, Kelly Jackson Higgins that um, you want to be very careful in your response to those because you may not want to uh, to tip off the perpetrators. And I think the FBI, um, who spoke earlier today, has has some thoughts on that too because they really want to gather evidence and uh, and prosecute these people. What's the, what what's the first once you once you've seen that indicator that you that you've been breached? What's the very first thing you should do? Well, you want to protect the evidence so that you, know, you have a chain of custody. Um, and so in, in, in many situations, logs are admissible as evidence. So you would want to secure those and then, and then take them off site and secure them. Um, right. And, and, and that's one of the, you know, again, I think Carla, again, and it's not like Carla and I are related. I just, she brought up the point. You know, as, you know, as the pr one of the good reasons for having a solution is that, you know, some of the solutions, a lot of them out there actually, you know, are, are able to preserve that evidence. I mean, and they do it in a way where it's, it's legally admissible. That, and that's key. That's something that, you know, I don't believe native tools can provide. You know, you're looking at your logs and you want to preserve the evidence. Well, a solution, you know, a, a purchased security information event management solution, for example, can preserve that in evidence in an archive in a way that it's legally admissible. So that protects, you know, your organization. Okay. Very good. These are these are great thoughts. Um, uh, thank you for the questions that are continuing to come in. I, I wish we had time to answer them all, um, but uh, I assure you that somebody will get back to you if we weren't a able to address your question in the course of this webcast. But at this point, I'm afraid that we have to uh, have to wrap things up here. I want to uh, thank everyone for attending, and I also, of course, want to thank uh, Garve and Renee. And I, I wish we could clone both of them so that we could have many, many more of them. Um, I would like to uh, to ask you to fill out the feedback form by clicking on the survey button. You'll find that located in the toolbar below the presentation window. Uh, to complete the form, just press the Submit button at the bottom of the page. And thanks in advance. Your participation really helps us do a better job each time we bring you these, these types of events. With that, thanks again for attending the NetIQ Platinum Sponsor Feature Presentation, Stop the Breach Before It Happens, Easy, Smart, and Powerful Security Management Solutions. This was brought to you by NetIQ. Information Week and Dark Reading, along with UBM Tech Web. They can view today's event on demand by accessing the virtual event on demand, and it's going to be available until October 20th of 2012. So you've got some time. Uh, share it with a colleague. A lot of people you know probably could benefit from this as well. Coming up next, we have the Identifying Advanced Persistent Threats in an Enterprise Environment. Advanced Persistent Threats was, was the term I was looking for. Um, and uh, Kelly Jackson Higgins from uh, Dark Reading, I believe, is going to be moderating that. It's one you don't want to miss. For more information on the program agenda within today's virtual event and all of the, uh, the events, please visit the auditorium and you'll see all of those listings. It'll give you presentations and time. This webcast is copyright 2011 by United Business Media, LLC. 
The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted, if that's the case, by NetIQ, Information Week, and Dark Reading, as well as UBM Tech Web. They are all solely responsible for their content, and the individual speakers, such as myself, are solely responsible for our content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Garv Hayes and Renee Bradshaw from NetIQ, I'm Steve Kovsky. Thanks for your time. Have a great day.